Hello, everyone joining today. Happy Thursday. Welcome to our Zoom side chat. This is the third in a three part series on employer brand. Thank you for joining. We're just going to wait a minute or two for um, people to trickle in. If you're just joining today, um, this is part three of a three part series on employer brand. You don't need to have attended the first two. Um, and we're gonna dive into amplifying or marketing your employer brand today. We're gonna kick off in a minute or two once everyone has joined. Um, so just hold tight. And while we're waiting to get started, please start to think about your questions you may have for our panelists on amplifying your employer brand. Um, and we're going to try something different than we have in past weeks if you've attended prior Zoom side chats. Just enter your questions in the Q&A um, function. You can see it on the bottom of your screen. We really should charge people to show up to the be before of the meeting because that's more fun. I mean, that, that, that's a, <laughs> that is a two drink minimum level of conversation. That's true. Yeah. You guys just missed a pretty no rambunctious check-in before this. Hi, Tammy. <laughs> Great to see you too, see you. All right, let's just give it one more minute while people trickle in. Thanks again for joining. We're talking um, employer brand today and how to amplify or market your employer brand. Um, and like uh, someone just posted now, thank you for thinking of your questions. We thrive off of discussion with, with you during these calls. So please, the more the merrier. Um, try and put your questions into the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. That will help us get to as many questions as we can. Who mentioned a worksheet last time? Was that me? No, that was from part one, James, which I think you okay. weren't. Um, um, like, did me... I forget my homework? <laughs> Suddenly I'm back in class in my underwear going, ah, I forgot to study. Oh, never mind. Okay. I got it. Yeah, I was um, curious which one she meant. But. Okay, so let's wait one more second for people to join. Thanks everyone who's here. We're talking amplifying your employer brand today. Um, we're really excited to dive in. And just one last time um, to reiterate, we really thrive off of having this be a discussion with you. So please um, drop any questions you may have for our panelists into the Q&A and we'll try and get to them um, We'll try and get to them all if we can. We have about an hour here. If we like all them. Right. <laughs> if we like them. All right, Laurie, over to you. All right, great. I'm muted. Hold on. No, we can hear you. Oh, okay, hi. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Sorry about that. Um, we, as Adrian said, we're doing part three of our three-part employer brand series. Uh, we have our guests here, Raphael Marcus and James Ellis, and they are going to both uh, experts in um, employer brand in their own right. Um, and I will let them momentarily introduce themselves and tell you a little bit about their background. Um, I am Lori Golden. I'm the head of uh, Comit Elastic Recruiting. Comit is a next generation applicant tracking system, very collaborative in nature, uh, focused on automation and efficiency as well as collaborating together. Um, and the Comit Elastic Recruiting is an extension of your recruiting function. Um, we as a team can help you out as you scale your company um, in rather than hiring an internal team, we have um, kind of an, an augmented uh, version of a recruiting team that can step in very simply and very easily and, and help you scale. So um, any questions about that, feel free to reach out to me offline. And then I'm going to turn it over and we're gonna introduce uh, both James and Raphael and uh, we'll get to the topic at hand. As Adrian said, please uh, send your questions over in the Q&A format um, in that tab on the bottom there so that we can make sure we get to everybody's questions. Um, if we don't, again, all of us and our contact information will be provided uh, and you can reach out to any one of us after the fact. Um, and then we're going to uh, pick it up. Our next topic is gonna be diversity and inclusion. I just wanna give everybody a little tease on that. Um, and uh, we're gonna dive in on, on some good content in that area as well. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to James first uh, cause he's next to me in the box on the top of my screen. And um, who are you, James? I have no idea. I've lost my marbles completely. <laughs> uh, 
uh, employer brand? Wait, that's a thing? What, what, what are you talking about? No, I am James Ellis. I am an employer brand nerd. Um, I am now starting to tell people that if you search the words employer brand nerd, I show up as many as seven different times on the first screen of Google. So if Google says I am that, I must be that. So there we are. I have a podcast called The Talent Cast, and I have a newsletter called The Employer Brand News. It's in the note in the chat bit. So if you want to sign up for that sort of stuff, you do that. Otherwise, I just love employer brand. I work for Universum. We talk about employer brand with data, which is a lot of fun, but uh, that's I can't wait to talk about activation and getting people excited about employer brand. Raff. Great uh, transition, time. James. Thank you. Um, so, uh, hey, everybody. I'm Raphael. Um, some of you guys uh, may have seen me in the, the last couple of uh, fireside chats. So, uh, great to see you again. Um, just some background on me. Uh, I used to work at LinkedIn. Uh, and I was selling uh, employer branding, basically strategy and media. Um, a small chance I sold to somebody on the webinar right now. Um, that was a great experience. Uh, you know, I worked with hundreds of TA teams, uh, learned a lot, uh, and got a lot of exposure. Um, and that was kind of my uh, uh, kind of PhD in you know recruitment marketing. And so, uh, and then I actually switched to the client side uh, after LinkedIn and led employer branding at a extremely hyper growth uh, company uh, called UiPath. Uh, where me and Lori met, um, and I basically led employer branding there. Uh, and after two years there, I decided uh, it was time for me to uh, go off on my own. So uh, now I own my own consultancy, uh, basically uh, called RBM Consulting, uh, which focuses on uh, employer branding, of course, uh, and a few other things. Um, but employer branding is really, really the sweet spot. So uh, thanks, everybody, for coming. and excited to talk about uh, activating or promoting the employer brand. Awesome, wonderful. So in the first part of the series, we talked about uh, discovery and even understanding who you are as a company, what what the big why is. Sorry, my dogs are going nuts, my new coworkers. Um, at the second one, we talked about how to kind of boil that down and distill that down to some messaging that's meaningful and that's going to attract the right kind of talent uh, to your company. And now we're going to talk about uh, my favorite stuff, which is really amplifying that brand and, and how you can do that internally, externally, um, and, and who can be part of that in some interesting uh, and creative ways um, to let companies, uh, let, sorry, candidates know who you are. So um, first question is, so once you've kind of boiled down to that messaging, what, what's the first step? I mean, do you have to launch internally um, before you can go outside? And what does that look like? Um, go ahead, James. Yeah, I take a funny approach to this. So I, when I ran Groupon's employer brand, um, you know, it's a good sized company, 6,000 people, 16 countries, global footprint. I had zero budget. I spent $400, $400 my first year and it was very much a guerrilla marketing campaign. So I took a very MacGyver-esque approach to these things. And it, was, it wasn't how do I drop seven, $70,000 on this channel or how do I make 4,000 videos? It was really about how do I make this a compelling conversation? And most of the materials I looked at was not about employer brand is a big monolithic thing you push out into the world. It was really about how do you develop kind of an internal volunteer army? How do you build a movement inside your company such that and for people who are stuff, who are already kind of thinking this stuff and already want to play ball with you, they, they step up, they speak up, and they engage with you. And as you work with them, other people around them see what's going on. They go, oh, that's interesting. Let me play ball with you. And let that slowly snowballs into something bigger. And then from there, you can kind of direct it in a given spot. Um, but really, I'm a big believer in there's no set thing, such thing as a set strategy. You work with the materials and the context that you have. If you're a, I don't know, pick it, a Facebook, a Google, an Amazon, a massive company, a deeply well-funded startup, and you have stacks of cash, I say go with the cash. I love spending cash if I have it. But in cases that or most of us are in, we have no cash. So we have to think about what are the resources we have at our disposal. For me, it was people. Um, if you are a uh, e-commerce company, what's going on the box? What's on the tape on the box? How are you pushing messages out? I got a, a box from Target last week and it has Target tape on it. I'm like, well, it says Target.com. Like, yeah, that's great. But I had to go to Target.com to place the order. So this is not new information. This is completely wasted opportunity for somebody to say, I will pay to print some stuff on some tape, which you're buying already, to put my message out, message out there. So what do you have at your disposal is step one. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I, I don't disagree with anything James said. I think he's, he's right. Yeah. Um, one yeah. point that I'll, um, 
one point that I'll uh, kind of elaborate on is uh, every situation is different, um, which, you know, basically is what James said. Uh, I do come from a bit of a different mindset uh, as James, um, and this might be because I was on the sales side uh, first, uh, and maybe that influenced me to think think a little bit more about the money than um, than maybe other others might. Uh, but the way that I think about, you know, the first thing that you have to do is, yeah, uh, I think what James said is really important is, you know, who's around to participate and to amplify for you. Uh, it's great to identify those people. And that can often be the same people who, for example, are part of a culture council, or if that exists in your company or employee experience, that kind of thing. People who live and breathe the company uh, inside and out are probably the lowest hanging fruit in terms of who wants to participate uh, and, you know, help you uh, promote content, right? And that's why uh, social media is so powerful and tools like Elevate or uh, Dynamic Signal or, or you know, what have you um, are really, really strong for getting, you know, ambassadors to uh, communicate out. Now, um, I do think about, you know, if I was coming in uh, to consult or, you know, if I was leading employer branding at a company, uh, my mind would go to, you know, how much budget can I get? Uh, you know, how, how big it can be um, and, you know, how then do I use that budget uh, strategically? Um, so Adrian, if you don't mind pulling up, uh, you know, one of the visuals, the first visual uh, I showed in the, uh, the first webinar uh, was basically an approach that I take to figure out how much budget I might need. Um, so for those of you who saw this again, just a reminder, um, that I look at three major data points. Uh, what's the demand of the current audience that we're audiences that we're trying to attract, uh, just generally demand, um, which is you see on the Y axis going up and down. So the higher up they are, the, that audience, the, uh, higher the demand is, and then how engaged are they with us? Right. Which you can get from your LinkedIn rep if you want to use LinkedIn as a proxy uh, or take a look at, you know, other platforms or sites you're on and just see what, you know, what activity is like. Um, and it's going to be different for different roles. Right. So if you're if you uh, are at Home Depot, you know, you might have a strong brand with, you know, retail salespeople, but software engineers, maybe not so much. Right. Um, and so using this can figure out how much budget you need. And then once you have budget, you can actually optimize, thank you, Adrian, uh, for reading my mind, you can actually optimize by applying different funnels based on the different situation you're in with different audiences. Uh, and just for clarity, the A here means awareness, the E means engagement, and L means leads. And what you can see is basically that, you know, I've determined, okay, I need this much budget for these audiences, and now I'll be able to figure out how much money should I spend with uh, awareness for software engineers who are in the top left. That amount of money for awareness is gonna be higher or more, take more of my budget than uh, in the bottom right, where you see the purple audience, which I forget who, who it was, but you can see the A, the awareness, isn't even uh, being highlighted, which means I don't need to spend anything there because we have enough engagement, strong enough engagement, um, and uh, it's low enough demand. Uh, so you can just kind of leverage the engagement you already have versus trying to create awareness, which might already exist. Um, so this is a way that I, that I try to figure out how to spend the dollars that I got. Um, and, uh, you know, the idea is to optimize ROI. Um, we can go into more details about other stuff uh, shortly, but I'll, I'll end there. So we've used Home Depot a couple of times as an example and, and talked about their need for software engineers. And of course, we've worked with a lot of tech companies combined, uh, the three of us here. What is the real difference between, you know, amplifying your employer brand to a B2C company versus a B2B? I mean, there must be many more opportunities on the B2C side, you know, because you have your talent are probably also your customers. How does that work? Yeah, you have to manage your consumer halo, or at least be aware of the consumer halo. I, I, I think it's no surprise that everybody wants to work at Google for years and years and years, not because they did amazing employer brand. In fact, they did almost no employer brand because it was the tool we all use from research, our email, our maps, whatever. So they had they could coast on their consumer brand for a very long time, and, they, and to some extent that they did. 
nothing wrong with that. And if you've got a great consumer brand, absolutely use it. Um, you know, this is going to be very much a use every part of the Buffalo situation, right? If you have great consumer halo, you use it. If you don't have it, well, you got to go look elsewhere. Now for some consumer brands, um, the Venn diagram of who your customers are and who's going to work for you is two separate circles, in which case, okay, no consumer halo to work with, but there's nothing wrong with that. There are other things you can work with. B2B to, B2, B2, work with this all the time. For the most part, people who work in B2B never engage or would never be a potential customer of that product before they use it. But, but really, you know, think of what every little touch point your marketing team does on your consumer side, every single touch point, every single engagement, every mailer, every email, every flyer, every cardboard stand up by the checkout counter, every receipt tape, every, I mean, the, the stickers with the price tags on the shelves, if we're going to go to a Home Depot or a Target kind of situation. So many opportunities. The question is, how do you tap into it without, one, disrupting what marketing is already doing? And to them, this, there's a very finely balanced calculus of where the messaging are and not too much messaging and not too little messaging. You don't want to get in there and get in, the, in that mess. What you want to do is say, look, there's a way for us to work together where uh, supporting me supports yourself to say, look, the people who work here aren't just customers. They know all the customers. They hang around customers. They are, you know, go to the same parties and barbecues and beer, beer halls and what have you. They are engaged. It's a very similar audience. So the more we can activate what people like working about here, people are going to be more likely to want to buy here. And the dog would agree with me. Maybe not everybody else, but at least the dog would because I can read dogs' minds. That's a superpower I have. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I don't have much to add because James pretty much covered all of it. Um, what I would just say is that uh, the employer branding on the consumer side is more risky, like way more risky. Um, if, and that's, that's because of the relationship between, you know, perception of even, not just your uh, consumer sided company's brand, but how they treat their people. Right. Um, and that's going to affect how people want to buy or not buy. Um, we talked uh, recently, maybe it was in the first one, or I'm not sure if it was in the second webinar, about Richard Branson studying Virgin Media and understanding, learning that a bad, uh, a bad employee uh, candidate experience led to a loss of you know five million or, or so uh, dollars in sales uh, because those people who had a bad experience no longer wanted to be in a customer of Virgin, uh, Virgin Media. So, um, so that's just something to think about or remember is that if you're on the consumer side, you know just because of context, the risk is much higher. Um, yep. You saw that, you know, all this stuff that happened with Amazon, uh, you know, an employee uh, complained about being mistreated and just like, it doesn't matter which direction it went or uh, how it ended, but it was just chaos. Um, and a lot of that is because people are uh, afraid to, um, or, you know, you can be afraid to upset the, the actual customers and it's like a minefield out there right now, because not just right now, but just in general, because of social media and, uh, and what I would consider oversensitivity. Um, you know, it's it's just how it is. Uh, so just just be careful if you're on the consumer side, and work really closely with your branding and marketing team or agency. Yeah, and there's a lot of studies that show if you screw over your candidates, they're going to stop buying from you, it's, and it does have an impact. T-Mobile is a great study, too. Um, there's a couple of them. The thing is, is that you have to be uh, very aware that they are similar people, and so if you try to talk to them from two different sides, you're going to be misaligned, and you're going to get mismixed mixed messages, and that's rough to do. That said, your marketing team should want to talk to you a lot more these days because you are carrying a lot more of the customer brand than you were, say, I don't know, seven weeks ago um, you know you the how people treat how companies treat their employees directly correlates not just candidates but their employees directly correlates to how much I want to buy at that grocery store or that grocery store if I go into the grocery store and I see that the deli guy is not wearing a mask and I get the sense that that grocery store is not taking care of their employees guess what last time I talked to you and I'm gone and that's you know since the line between the employee experience and the candidate experience is razor thin if there's any daylight between them at all. So you've got to kind of see it holistically. But the nice thing is with the situation, you have a lot more leverage than you did a while ago. So figure out how do you tap into that? Not in a, how do you take advantage of that? But more, how do you use that? How do you work together better? So you're actually supporting each other. Can we, there are obviously many different ways to, um, you know, amplify an employer brand and many different actual like deliverables involved in that. Can we talk about what some of the main ones are and then some of the really wild, bold and crazy ones? You go first, Ruff. 
um, what it, you said examples of, of content of employee branding? Yeah, so, or so, just so channels. What can you do? There's a, there are, there's so many yeah. different places where your employer brand can be amplified. Career page, yeah. videos, blogs, um, you know, human stories from inside the company, um, events, of course. Let's talk about what some of the ones are that are, you know, like the lowest hanging fruit, the ones that, that are most common. And then what are some a little bit more creative, unusual um, means? Yeah. Like um, tape, tape messaging. Unfortunately, I think the more common ones are going to be more of the like stock photos and uh, more generic, like like values being listed that you can kind of tell uh, were is a little bit of a service more than, you know, authenticity. Um, and, you know, I think that's changing, but uh, very slowly. Um, and I, you know, I think people are, people are scared uh, or leaders are scared about uh, being too vulnerable or, or exposing too much of themselves. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's, there's an um, enormous amount of ways you can do it uh, all the way from, kind of uh, leaning more towards uh, what James was, ta James was talking about and what Lisa, I think, was asking about, which is no budget, which is give your employees the permission to, you know, show themselves, right? Um, and, you know, that, that may sound uh, simple, but it's actually, I don't, I don't think it is. Um, you know, you could assume that employees are going to show who they are anyway, but I think people are hesitant unless you're at a company that has that culture built in already. Um, and it's, you know, I think they will only feel safe if leadership one communicates and reinforces that and two actually participates themselves. Um, so a good way, uh, Lisa, for example, is to let people use the tools they have, which is cell phones and social media, which are all free, uh, or that they have already, but a way to kind of spark the fire and keep the fire going is by having senior leaders participate. Um, and you know you don't need budget to do that. You just need a line to them and get them to listen, which is a whole different different challenge. Um, but that that's one way to do it. Um, and then you know at UiPath, the company I, I worked at uh, previously, um, we did some really kind of out there videos, um, but they reflected. You know, there was like a talking unicorn puppet interviewing people, and it was rude and whatever. Just like Bank of uh, America. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, that was kind of the the real culture at UiPath, but you know, a lot of other companies, if you came to a leadership and said you want to do something that they, I mean, they'd kick you out of the room, maybe out of the building. Um, you know, events are a fantastic way to bring your employer brand to life. Although personally, uh, I don't like to do events that are, you know, recruiting, recruiting driven uh, explicitly to the audience um, and more do events reflecting interesting thing the companies, the, the company is doing, the technology, blah, blah. Uh, that is, you know, understood also or can be understood as a way to uh, recruit people, but it's not, you know, really a recruiting event. Um, yeah, and there, there's, I mean, there's millions of ways. Also, lots of platforms you can participate on and, of course, social media. Uh, James, I'm sure you have stuff to add. I mean, yeah, rec recruiting events are only going to attract professional job seekers who you are going right. to get in their job postings anyway, so don't bother. Right. I mean, I think I'm a big believer in education. I'm a, I believe that if you talk about something and teach people something, they're far more likely to engage with you in return, right? Um, there's so many different ways to do that. But, I, you know, you, know you, you said something that it, it kind of sparked this idea that, you know, there are standard ways of doing things. The thing you just, it's show yourself, right? And that's like telling someone getting into the dating pool, just be yourself, Oh, it's that easy. Okay, I'm just going to go be myself and people of the opposite or same sex, I don't know, no judgment, are going to flock all over me? No, of course not. Learning how to be yourself, the whole concept of know thyself is some of the deepest, hardest to activate advice in the world. It's so simple. And yet somehow the more you think about it, the more deep it becomes and the harder it is to do. But the same is said about employer branding, knowing who you are, Understanding how to talk about it in a way that makes sense that it's aligned is so hard to do, and yet that's really what we're expected to do. The question is, how do you open up the the the, the lanes for people to do that? Now, I think Roth's right. Right, you know, you talk to leadership, and you they very much a show to don't tell, and if people see you, you do it, you end up doing it. I think another act a way to do it is to 
provide guide rails is to really say, look, these are the rules. And some people have a social media policy in place. I think you could take it a step further. You could say, look, here's 10 examples of things that will get you fired. And here's 10 examples of things that we would love for you to talk about. Not do this, don't do this. Not say this, say this, say this. You know, you don't want to turn people into minor birds. But when people have uncertainty about what they're allowed to post, they tend to just kind of back away and, and say it under their breath or over in glass door where you know, it scares the crap out of you as it should. Uh, but if you give them you know, a guideline to say, this is what's okay and this is what's not, they're gonna be more inclined to do it. There's a knock on effect to that that I don't think people talk about. And that is, if you provide clear guidelines and maybe, I don't know, you get them somehow certified in some manner, your HR team and legal teams will swing by your house with a big basket of cupcakes because they are going to be so thrilled that you provided certification processes, things that they could say, once they cross this line, they get fired, got it, clearance, fast rules. They love that. They can't get enough of that. And so if you really want to activate your internal audiences, think about how to certify them so that they know the rules and that your legal people, you know, get that you, what you're doing. And it creates great, great opportunities for you to build uh, allyship inside that, inside those teams. Yeah. And I, I, I have a actually- great example of that too, if I can jump in real quick. Yeah. Um, I worked at a company called JustWorks um, a few years ago, and after they had come out with the guidelines for their employees like that, they set up um, headshots for employees that were kind of branded by the company. And they also set up some really cool, um, just like social media assets, images that we could plug and play um, and use ourselves. But the headshots were really awesome. And it was just an employee who had a really nice camera and had experience. It cost literally $0. Yeah, that's all we it takes. Set it, and, and we brand, you know, we just branded it with the company's branding and everyone had really nice headshots and was really proud of using them on their social accounts. So. LinkedIn yeah. banners, yeah, social mm-hmm. media just banners. Say, I mean, LinkedIn banners for, for you iPad Lori, do you remember the crazy ones oh, with yeah. unicorn? The like we came up with like yeah. yeah, really goofy, like, but you know, again, reflective of our of our thing. But you know, when people um joined the company uh, that we worked at last, it was a very exciting moment. So and you know, not everybody's gonna be in this situation, but there was this huge demand for like what kind of stuff can I put on my LinkedIn? And so what we did was we built a microsite using SharePoint. Um to, or is it point share, whatever, uh, the microsite, uh, Microsoft uh, thing that you can build uh, sites with. Um, we built a microsite uh, designed basically for people to be able to click something, download it, and put it into their LinkedIn profile, which included banners, um, Video uh, not headshots, because, you know, we, well, we provided headshots, but at an event. Um, we provided like video, like the one we talked about, and also like uh, our culture deck. And I put in the, uh, the microsite, I actually uh, paired it, paired all the content with instructions of how to put it on your LinkedIn profile and where to put it. Because not everybody knows that you can put a PDF like in your summary or under your current experience and that kind of stuff. So we built like a really comprehensive site for uh, helping people build their LinkedIn profiles with content on it. Uh, and that brings me to another, um, another point about LinkedIn. Uh, I want to give a quick tip uh, about... Why should we listen to you about LinkedIn? What do you know about LinkedIn? <laughs> yeah, so, well, listen at your own risk. Um, but but uh, one, um, one thing I want to tell people to piggyback on what James was saying in terms of getting your, your employees activated, it might not be that easy, uh, you know, just to think about people who are really active in your company and really, you know, believers and all that, especially if you're in a huge company. So what you can do, I'm just going to share my screen here. I'm going to show you, um, show you a tip. Um, what you can do is type in uh, any company, so UiPath, my former company, and instead of uh, clicking on the auto-populated thing here, click the search button. One second. And then, a very little known tip, uh, press content. And what you're going to see is a bunch of people from that company, so let's assume this is your company, who are posting very actively. Okay. Right. This tells you people who are actually live, like literally. They're raising their hands. They're literally saying, I want to play a game. I want to play with saying, you. Let's do yeah, this. Yeah, saying, I'm excited. I am, look, look at this. I am so proud, right? Like, you know, and these aren't only first three connections. Um, so you can learn about people in your organization that you never knew existed, or even people that you knew existed, but didn't, uh, didn't know that they were such champions uh, until you looked 
here or okay. you know similar places you know online or whatever um, great tip. so just a quick tip and another a free way uh, to uh, you know get get stories out there and everything is to use uh, to encourage these people that you find to write uh, long form articles so you know you can start uh, you can write an article you know one of these uh, which then gets attached to your profile etc cetera, etc cetera. and then if this is posted you can actually take the link copy it and put it on uh, on the career page I don't know if UiPath still has those but um, like LinkedIn allows you to link mm -hmm. articles written on LinkedIn to the life page. I'll try to scroll down. Usually the best the way to get yeah. people to do that is to provide the resources to make it easier. At, offer right. copy editing, offer images, yeah. offer, you know, kind of just a second set of eyes. Again, if they're nervous that what they say isn't going to be useful or they, they might get in trouble, they won't do a darn thing. But if you can make it easy, increase right. the skids a bit, they'll jump right in. Yeah, and you see Guy, you know, Guy Kirkwood wrote this article in, you know, in February. Now, once he writes it, yes, you can put it here. You could also send this article to your entire company and say, you know, feel free to share, share it. it. Or you can post it, uh, you know, from your company onto LinkedIn or, or other places and then take the link to that post and share it, you know, in email or in Slack with your entire company. And then you're starting to get some of that organic social media uh, behavior from your employees uh, all for free. Um, so I just wanted to show people that that quick tip. Uh, I hope it was helpful. I got one since we're since we're playing the share my screen game. So my friend Audra Knight over at Foundation Media, Foundation Medicine, put, just put this together. It's public, so if you Google Foundation Medicine Talent Brand Kit, you will get this. It's the top result. She just made a public facing website that has all the stuff. It's the kit of everything you need to talk about. It's, hey, here are pillars and here's our EVP. Here's a message, but really, here's the stuff you can share. Here's how to change your LinkedIn banner. Here's how to change this information. Here's get your, how to get your head shot. How to, you know, here's the videos you can share. And she just dumps all this stuff in here knowing, and of course, you got to promote it a bit internally, but to say, this is one-stop shopping. In one spot, I'm going to teach you everything you need to know. You know, I think it's fascinating how many people who are highly trained, incredibly smart professionals who have no idea how to change the banner on LinkedIn, who have no idea that they can be active in that space or that they should explain their job a little bit or, or connect with other people. So making it easy, if that's the channel you want to leverage, is the best, you know, is a great way to do that. So I highly recommend Audra's material here. This is, this is great work. That's really beautiful. It really is a great page. Um, so now we're going to take, um, we're going to shift a little bit and answer some of these questions. We have some wonderful questions in the Q&A. Um, so Adrian, if you want to go ahead and, and throw out the first one there. Yeah, so um, let's, let's maybe combine, or why don't we talk careers page? That's the kind of top rated question here, right? So Emily asked, if you're redesigning a careers page, what tips do you have to make a good impact? So we've talked kind of channels off of your, your own website. Why don't we talk a little more about your own careers page building on property you own that's always a good idea yeah. <laughs> i you know i think this goes actually so emily it's a, it's a great question and obviously people are uh have a similar one you know have the same question in mind um i think this actually goes back to the first two webinars which is first i mean you really have to discover who you are um and you know the career page itself what i wouldn't do which i unfortunately see too often is you know, a static image, uh, one paragraph about what it's like to work there and then a list of jobs. Uh, or, and and know, it's on the here. corporate site. It's not even on its own navigation. It's trying right. to sell you products while it's trying to get you to engage right. in the jobs. Right, um, which, is, which is sad. Um, so the first thing I would think of, Emily, is what is the experience you really want people to have and walk away with? Um, and that, does, that means not only potentially limiting it to just a page, right? Maybe it's a career site to James's point. Um, maybe there is more to it than just the main navigation. Um, and, you know, I would think about, obviously, who is it that, you know, that you want to, um, that you want to recruit and maybe prioritize some of the more, the tougher audiences uh, that, you know, you haven't broken through with yet. Uh, and you know that you're going to get more traffic because you're advertising to them or whatever, um, and really focus on them. So maybe you build a, a Teams page for engineering, uh, maybe one for sales or, you know, for everywhere else uh, that, that you want to grow. But, you know, again, everything should be uh, designed around what you want people to take away um, and without, without real limitations, really, uh, but also reflective of who you really are, which stems from your, your values, builds up to your EVP and your EVP pillars, your, your value proposition to people should really be what 
uh, a big thing that people take away is what do I get by joining? Uh, mm -hmm. In addition to what is the culture like, what it's like inside the walls. Those are the two things that I think uh, are most important when thinking about a redesign. Um, but again, it all has to come through the lens of like, why do you exist? Uh, who you are as an employer and to highlight the, the benefits of, of being part of that family or that company. Yeah, I think if you're focusing on, especially a front page, which by the way, you have to think about who exactly is typing in your company dot jobs. I mean, who exactly is that person? Chances are they're coming in from a job board. Statistically, if you look at your stats, most of your tra traffic is coming from a job board or it's coming from, there are a couple other sites that it's coming from. So they're already predisposed to have a sense of, wait, who is this company? What's it all about? And at that stage, the mistake is, I'm going to tell you what my company is all about. Yeah, but I don't care. I mean, I don't care. If you tell me what you're all about, I don't believe it. I don't embrace it. I don't, it's, I don't, it's, it's not useful or credible. It's just, it's a paragraph, right? It's that thing that you're going to stick into a poster. And someone referred to that stuff as poster fodder, which I thought was incredibly descriptive. The junk that you don't have to pay attention to because someone turned into a poster so I can ignore that, right? What you need to do is think about how are you different? This is a game of differentiation. There are 18 million businesses in North America alone. And I think that number is conservative these days. Um, you know, there are so many options. This is everybody can work remote. Literally, you're thinking about you are competing at 17 million plus of companies who are offering similar benefits and similar wages in similar places and similar sets. You got to have something to differentiate. Oh, yeah. No, but and then beer on Friday because magically that's all better with a ping pong right. table. It's all bull. It's all junk. It's about right. what makes you different. And that gets back to that know thyself thing. It is about, look, it's you not, you know, you want to compete on what the, who has the better coffee, I guess, you know, there's someone, maybe it's me, who would say, oh, you have better coffee, I want to work there. Maybe that would be me, but really that's not going to drive. It's got to be understanding what do you care about, what matters to you, what is the, the, the change you're making in the universe by being in this business. Extrapolate that out into what does that mean to a person and then show how that's different from other people. Now, you touched on something earlier, Roth, about stock footage or stock images, and I think, the, the problem with stock images is that it's not true. It's about some other company. It's a play about a company that isn't yours and you decided to slap your label on it. The mistake is not then to say, I'm gonna make my own stock art. It's gonna be just as glossy and just as pretty, but with my actual people, you're like, yeah, it's not really a step forward because no one will believe that that's you, is to be real. It is to show the stuff. And I think there's another question about negative engagement, which I think is fascinating because I'm a big believer in, if I tell you that my company is innovative, I better back it up. I, it better be true at the ATS level. It, it better be true at the website level. It better be true at the LinkedIn level. It's got to be innovation that sees everywhere. But if I tell you I'm innovative, but we're all focused, think of Amazon 20 years ago when Jeff Bezos had that door on the sawhorses. They were a company changing the world, but they had doors as desks. That's where they were. They were, they were, they were scrappy. They were showing themselves for who they truly were. Yes, they're innovative, but you could see that they were making individual sacrifices in service of that innovation. And let's be fair, that was true across the whole company. They weren't taking, they weren't making profit. They weren't paying out dividends. They were saying everything goes to the business. You know, people be damned, individuals be damned. This is all about the concept of making the world's greatest store. That rings true because the CEO is sitting at a door. Yes, and that doesn't prove innovation. What it does, it proves sacrifice towards something. And that's where you can say, this is true. If I'm willing to sacrifice money to a, to a, a charity, I must believe in that charity. If I just say, oh, that's a nice charity and don't give us any money, I don't believe in it. In the same way, the, what is the company sacrificing in order to get? What are the individuals sacrificing in order to get? Understand that, distill that, and your messages will be twice as strong because it will be crystal clear that this is a no BS, understandable, hey, 90% of people don't want this, but the 10% of people who do are going to fall in love. That's where your career site should be focused. How do I get someone to go, oh, wow, I've never seen it put that way. I've never seen a company think that way. That's new. That's interesting. And from there, you just run. Uh, and Susan had a... Oh, Go I was ahead. just going to say, Kayla asked about EVP and we just talked about it. I just wanted to quickly address that. Is that all right? Or... Yeah, yeah. Go for it. So, Kayla, um, thanks for your question. Uh, your first question about fintech, uh, you know, I don't have that off the top of my head. We, you know, I would need to, you know, dive into a lot of research uh, so we can potentially talk about that offline. Um, but your second question about how to put your EVP, EVP out there, um, basically you asked, uh, do you just publish it and influence everything you do or do you 
or do you publish it everywhere? Uh, I would say that it's a little bit of the first part, um, which is uh, let it be and let it influence things. Um, I mean, it, it more or less your EVP, uh, and usually it's not just, it's generally not just one thing. It might be a, like three pillars or something of, of you know, value propositions or whatever. Um, that I would certainly highlight like on the career page and be kind of an overarching, um, you know, thing people understand about working there. Uh, but I would not look at everything through that lens. I would actually, going back to the, the first webinar and I think part of the second, um, look through the lens of why do we exist and your, your, your employer brand, which is built on top of your values, uh, your proof points of those values, the EVP, and then from all of that, you can figure out like your essence as an employer brand. Um, and that's what I would actually communicate everything through the lens of, um, not as much specifically the, EV, the EVPs themselves. Um, so I hope that helps. I just wanted to quickly address that, Adrian. Can I throw something out there? I, I have a somewhat differing opinion, which is fun. Um, I like to argue with you. So I don't believe you should ever say your EVP. I think your EVP is a conceptual idea that never makes it outside of recruiting or HR's office. Maybe a CEO sees it once, goes, cool, that's fine. And they never have to think about it. It's an idea. What you show is a marketing and creative expression of that concept. And what you can say is, okay, if I'm taking that concept and expressing it to software engineers or to salespeople, they can be completely different expressions, but they're of the same idea. The second you say, here's my EVP and here are our pillars, you are locking yourself into a concept that one, is going to be fuzzy by nature. It's going to be a lot of BS, you know, you, until you prove it, until you show the edge of it, until you show the negative side of it, until you show what you're sacrificing. It's just a lot of poster fodder again. But if you tell the story about how this salesperson lives and breathes that idea, if you tell the story about how that software engineer pushes that forward, those are stories that are gra gonna grab my attention because they speak my language and I don't need to know the exact wording of the EVP. I just need to kind of create the conception in my mind. Here's a way of thinking about it. Everybody's seen the movie Airplane, right? Is that not the greatest disaster movie ever? Oh no, it's a comedy. Oh no, it's a love story. Oh no, it's a, it, it's, it's a thing and how you see it is how you perceive it. And, and there are people who see it as a great love story. There are people who see it as a great disaster flick. There are people who see it as a great comedy and they're all those things. It's everybody's looking at the same thing and coming away with different elements. Your EVP should be that thing because it's not the words, it's the concept those words are trying to express. So just be careful of just saying, here's my EVP, slap it on a poster and call it done or call, slap it on your career site and call it done. Yeah, I think the, uh, the, the disconnect between you and me, James, is that like everything you're saying is what I would call the employer brand. Um, mm. and, the and this e is where architecture is always fun. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Um, so I think it's, it's actually just uh, the words we're using, uh, but I think we're, we're actually on the same page. Um, yeah, because I think of like Amazon, Amazon's EVP is we pioneer, but you go to the career site, it doesn't really talk about that, but all the things it does and how it talks about that supports an idea around that. In fact, once you see that their brand is EV or EVP or however you want to call it, is We Pioneer, you start to see how it's being activated all these different ways. It's like, oh, it's crystal clear, it's, it's We Pioneer. But you didn't have to know those words to, under to get the same kind of gist out of it. Yeah, to me, the We Pioneer would be the brand essence or the, the employer brand. Um, but again, just different, different words we're using. Yeah, um, we'll do a whole yeah, webinar on uh, architectures. Uh, which question should we do next, David? Well, that was uh, kind of it, 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 that kind of uh, piggybacked a little bit on Mary Kate's question around kind of how to get people to put that authentic, um, their authentic stories, um, how to highlight that stuff on your career page, um, you know, beyond just the stuff that we create ourselves from within that team. But how do you get the the stories from the the field, let's say? I mean, going back to what I mentioned before is I would, you know, try to find some people who are willing, maybe already doing something uh, in terms of getting, being out there, not necessarily talking about the company, but, you know, people that are uh, already using social media, already posting on LinkedIn, whether it's about your company or not. Um, and, you know, try to filter through and find somebody who is not a bad writer, you know, a decent writer and have them talk about like the challenges of their job. What what challenge are they working on, right? This is ex especially interesting for the engineering audience, uh, which is what are you trying to accomplish? Uh, how are you doing it? Uh, what do you hope the outcome is? What are the bumps in the road in doing so? What kind of technology are you using? Um, that's all free, right? And, you know, Mary-Kate, I, I appreciate um, the, you know, cr creative lens, but sometimes 
you know, you don't even need to really get that creative. Um, I'd argue being more black and white is sometimes better and easier um, to get off the ground and to get, you know, permission for, uh, if that's something that you need before um, activating something. Um, and, you know, people can freely write on their own behalf. So, you know, I, I would dive a little more deeply into people's real experience at the company, um, particularly around their challenges. I would probably stay away from things about oh, our culture is so great, our culture is so great. That's not what really people care about. Um, you know, in consuming content, people want to be entertained, they want value, they want to be informed. Um, and, you know, if it's told the right way, simply explaining what you do, what you're working on, if you're in sales, like a, a big project that you worked on, or a big client you worked on that was exciting for whatever reasons, those are the kinds of things that uh, I would lean into um, and not take, not take for granted and not overthink or overcomplicate either. Um, I hope that's, that's helpful. Yeah, I, I think you're you're 100 right. My only caveat would be it's a lot of work to play journalist. It's a lot of work to interview and distill and understand. Like if I was to interview a machine learning person, what I would write would be total gobbledygook because I have no idea how machine learning works or what it is or data science or frankly I barely passed my statistics class the three times I had to take it. So I'm not the best person to do that, and that's. Unfortunately, sometimes what happens with content marketing approach is that you play journalist, you get just enough gist to kind of put it out there, but you don't sound like someone who gets it. So the more you can let people speak in their own words and provide the, the, the frameworks and structure for them to speak on their behalf, on their own behalf, to talk to and of their kind of people, the better off you're going to be. Now, asking them to write long articles where they interview themselves, that's a great way for to get exactly nothing back. You get a lot of crickets. But if you can ask a cute question, if you can kind of have a simple prompt, if you can say, show me one picture that illustrates what work is like here, just something that starts to get them, build the muscle, right? No one, none of us who were writers started by writing a novel. We started by writing a sentence and a paragraph and getting comfortable with it and getting good at it. Make it easy. Just ask for a sentence, a paragraph, something simple, a photo, a quick video, you know, a, a, a TikTok or even a, you know, just a short 10 second video that says, Show me something. Show me something interesting. Go as simple as what are three words that describes working here. Go with something as simple as um, you know what does your mom think you do here. What you know. Go to something as simple as what's the. You know, there's so many different things you can do, but just distill it to make it easy. Get people to engage. Get people to hang out with you to play the game, and then you can come back and say, great. Well, here's a second question. Let's do it that way. One, they make for great social content. Just absolutely great social content. There's actually a an app that will record a video and turn it into a GIF where the things you say turn into a word bubble visually. It's super cool. It's a little janky, it's a little glitchy, but it's a lot of fun if you can get it to work. And so if you say things, what are two words about what it's like to work here? And they say it, you record it, you have both a GIF and textual content that you can use over and over again. Though to Raph's point, you know, if, if that's not in your tone of voice, there's lots of other ways to do it. But if you are willing to be open, if you're willing to be more human and be goofy like that, there are lots of different fun apps to use like that. That's cool. Tamber is asking what that app is called. So if you I have no idea. It, oh my yeah. god. Maybe we'll we'll find it and and hopefully by the end of this, um, yeah. by the end. But I want to take I want to ask a two part COVID specific question because everybody has questions regarding right now and because of what we're going through and the times we're in and blah, blah. But these, these are, this is a two unrelated, but both specific to COVID. So Tanver's second part of his question, because I think we addressed the first, is what are some ideas on content for employer brand during this time on LinkedIn in particular? Like how can you leverage what's happening, you know, to show who you are as a company and how you take care of your people? And the second part of that is Ankit's question, which is he was repurposed. What should employer brand professionals be doing to sharpen their um, tools right now? Like, it, you know, if there's no activity, no budget, nothing going on there, what are some ways that employer brand professionals can kind of prepare for, um, you know, deeper learning of what's next? Yeah, I mean, for the right now, um, I hope I don't uh, offend anyone, but um, I would like, I'm getting close to throwing up uh, if I see one more like, you know, fluffy article or whatever about working from home. Like mm -hmm. it's like, I think we're past it. Not, not COVID, but past the moment right. where the explosion of 
um, you know, this is how I'm working from home stuff. I think it's, it's a dead horse. Um, and honestly, uh, I'm kind of hungry for other content, um, yeah. for content that has nothing to do with uh, COVID-19. Um, and, you know, it, it will go away eventually and it will, be, oh, you know, maybe it'll be here for a while. But I think people can really use a break. Um, and there's an idea right, right there. Here's some yeah. content to take a break from COVID-19. Yeah, like, you know, um, lean into it that way if, if you want. Um, but I would, I would almost kind of, kind of approach things from the lens of, yeah, COVID's here, but, what, you know, life goes on. Uh, business goes on. Hopefully everyone will be employed again, you know, shortly or, or whatever. Um, you know, let's talk about something that's interesting, uh, not, enter not necessarily just entertaining for entertainment's sake and to com not complain about COVID-19, but to vent about it. Um, I think it's, it's like an getting to the point of enough already. Um, and I think I, I, my feeling is that people have a hunger for a little bit of normalcy, um, in the content that they, they consume. Um, yeah, we reached peak inspirational message about three weeks ago. Um, it's, we, it's, yeah, it's saccharine. Yeah. Yeah. We, yeah. We, what's beyond that. And I think it is about getting back to work. It is about being better at stuff. And I, I think you're right. The 107,000th article on how to work from home from the person who just figured out how to work from home, despite the fact that many of us have been doing it for quite some time. And thank you very much. Those are wonderful words of advice. I appreciate that newbie anyway. Um, but I, you know, that and that's true, but it is about, you know, if you are in a world of um, everybody's talking about one thing, the value of you talking about something else is insanely underappreciated. If everybody's talking about this and you're following that best practice, you are simply one of many. You're simply yet another of talking about that thing and you're going to see diminishing returns every time you do it. If everybody's talking about inspiration, you should be talking about working hard. If everybody's talking about all the skills you're lear learning, you should talk about taking time off. If everybody's talking about taking time off, find a way to pivot and differentiate yourself, but then tie it back to that brand. Uh, I think that, that it's absolutely crucial. I would say from the second part of the question about what should you be learning, stay away from employer brand books as much as possible. I think a lot of employer brand blogs and podcasts, and I know I've got a couple of those, um, they do say a lot of the same stuff over and over again. And it's not about what's the new idea. It's about, okay, um, they're, they're just saying, how do you do that as best practice? And I'm, I don't like best practices. I think the best thinking comes from outside the market. And I don't mean go buy a bunch of marketing books. I think there's some value there, but there's a lot of not value. I think it's about, you know, how do you think about your challenges better? I, I love a beautiful constraint. I love a pirate inside. I love um, how buildings learn about thinking and systems. I love, you know, how do you see a bigger picture other than how do I craft a better article? Though, frankly, go take classes or in, you know, uh, master classes or Udemy's or whatever, or buy books on writing better. There's, that's never been a skill that goes bad. I mean, if you can write better headlines and you can write better subject lines, your emails are going to get read better. You're, it's just inherently good. So I would focus on outside the space if you have a good sense of what employer brand is and then bring those skills and ideas into it to say, how do I apply them here? Because I think that's, we're still all learning. And I know a lot of professionals who do this, who are really good at their job, but they learn, pull good stuff from the outside. That's where the best thinking can, can happen. Yeah. And uh, Emily uh, posted a, a really great idea for anybody that wants to read that in the chat. Um, I think it's great. Um, something like that, that's more around, uh, arguably like mental mental wellness um, and, you know, leaving anxiety and stress. I think that's fantastic, uh, especially internally, which is what Emily talked about. So uh, feel free to read her, her chat comment there. Um, I think it's really insightful. Um, thanks, Emily. Emily, can we make that public? Because you, you wrote that to the panelists. So I hope if you're comfortable, oh, yeah. I'd like yeah. to share that for everyone. Yeah. Thanks, Emily. Yeah. And, and there's a great example from two or three years ago. Does everybody remember, and this was very BuzzFeedable, and I hate quoting BuzzFeed, but here we are. Uh, about the woman who posted an email to her boss saying, hey, I just need a mental health day. I need a mental wellness. I just need it to break. And, and the CEO responded by saying, and literally responded to the entire company and said, hey, I want to thank this person for reminding us all that occasionally you need a break and we totally get it. You know, you'd expect the CEO to say, get back to work. How dare you? You're fired or something horrible like that. And it was a whole different spin. And honestly, that email of someone saying, I need a mental health day and a CEO saying, I'm so glad you're taking it. And everybody remember, you can take them when you need to because we want you healthy here. 
that went viral and that got millions and millions of impressions. And it's the same idea here. If you are showing what you're really all about, people want to see it. It's useful information. You don't have to see it. You don't have to kind of manufacture it, but it's there. It's laying around. You just have to kind of spot it and bring it to the, to the forefront. Are there any other questions? Yeah. Are there any other, we have about five well, minutes left. Mary's got a few upvotes. Should we, and it's actually, I think a pretty good one. Yeah. Um, I like this one. Uh, Adrian, do, should I just read it out? Um, yeah. So Mary, uh, thank you for the question. Um, she asked, uh, how would you deal with ne negative aspects in the employer brand? For example, uh, your pay and culture are great, but you have a reputation for long hours. How would you address this in social media messaging? Um, James, do you, do you want to start? Okay, so everybody knows that what engineers care about, and, and that's software engineers and physical engineers, what they care about are work-life balance, uh, great innovation, great code, but really the ability, great pay and great culture and great benefits yeah. and coffee and all this other stuff, which is why SpaceX, a company known for working people near to death, is listed as the number one place for those people to work. Huh. What you're seeing is that this is, again, if everybody's following best practices and looking at the averages of what people want, generic people want, they want the safe middle. But space is, SpaceX is a company that's saying, look, we're going to Mars. And there's no easy way to Mars. There's only the hard way to Mars. And if you're willing to go to Mars and you're willing to do the hard work, we're the only place you're going to want to work. And people go, that's true. I want to work at Mars. I want to go to Mars. That's the only place I would want to work. There are people who think the army is the best place to work, despite the fact that they're going to get shot at. There are people who think they want to be teachers, despite the fact that they don't get any long, good pay and their, their benefits are, are thin. If you understand what's positive about you, what you work for, you can use the negative to reinforce the positive. For example, SpaceX, it's not like they're saying, hey, we work, work long hours because we have nowhere else to be. They're saying, look, this is a hard challenge. And people who want a hard challenge are willing to work to succeed in that hard challenge. Now, could be a similar situation for you. So you have to ask yourself, what are the long hours in service of? You're saying this is how much we are committed to whatever that idea is, and this is a way we prove how commi committed we are to that idea. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, um, there's no, you know, bread and butter or, you know, silver bullet for uh, addressing, you know, a negative aspect in your employer brand. Um, it's just, it's not easy to do and you have to be really, really careful. Um, but I think James is right, uh, you know, to, to piggyback off him is you can lean into it um, and, you know, be honest about it. Uh, you know, it depends, you know, how much you want to draw attention to it or away from it. Um, if, you're, if your employer brand is famously bad, like really everybody knows, uh, then, you know, it, you might be comfortable enough to actually call it out. Uh, on your own career page or in on social media, you know, uh, platforms as well. Um, but I think uh, probably the best way to combat it um, is through authentic voices, right? Um, again, coming from your own employees. So it's hard for um, people to like hear a generic rumor about your, or have an overarching sense of your company in a negative way and then like from without necessarily hearing it from someone specific and it's just out there in the ether, uh, maybe on Glassdoor, but you know, usually there's positive ones too, um, even when there's a lot of negative ones. Um, but there's no face to those names and you know, they're all anonymous and everything. Um, some people do, I think, post fake ones. Um, it's a, a lot different to hear it from somebody directly, right? Uh, you know, on social media or, or anywhere else. If people are posting from their voice, uh, either video or written content or whatever, about how much they love the company and all the interesting things they're working on and et cetera, et cetera. You know, that's a way to combat it. Um, and, you know, it's up to you, uh, again, whether you want to call attention to the negative, uh, negative messaging or negative uh, sentiment that's out there or not. Um, I think there are very creative ways to do that. Um, but it has to be in line with, you know, everything else you're doing. And, you know, there's no one... Uh, you know, one solution for everybody in, in doing that. But, um, but yeah, again, I would lean into the authentic voices um, yeah. to tell that story. And that even without uh, going head to head with the negative, um, negative commentary about your, your employer brand, um, it still can have a massive impact um, just so people can figure it out on their own right? Is this really true? Or, you know, what, like, do people really like it there? Or maybe the people that are complaining about it 
maybe just weren't the right fit. Right. And maybe it is for me. Um, no. Yeah, and I think you're hundred percent right. I think to put it another way, you might say, look, the people who work there, they know about the long hours. So why are they doing, why do they put up with it? What's the reason behind it? That's what it means to get authentic. Why do these people who are ostensibly very smart, very capable, very good people, people you want to model all your new hires on, why do they do this? They're smart enough to know that this is long hours. They could get a better, a better job with less hours, and yet they've chosen this place. Why? Find that why, and it's going to unlock all the employer brand messaging for so much of what you do. Um, that's, that's really where a lot of that stuff is. And let's be fair. There's no such thing as a perfect job. There's no such job, thing as a job where there's not an aspect you hate. I think underlying this is the part of the job you're going to hate makes the good stuff that you put in your job posting infinitely more believable. So go ahead and just say, look, here's all the great stuff we have. Pay, culture, yada, yada. By the way, long hours. And people are going to go, okay, I see the bigger picture. I believe that. Yeah. Agreed. Um, all right. Great. Wow. We made it right to one o'clock on the dot. Um, people are going to be jumping off, but before you do, you will be getting this recording um, and recapping all the uh, resources that we shared and the, the Giphy maker and all these things will be part of that email. And you'll get that in the next couple of days. And uh, please join us um, for our next one, diversity and inclusion. And we'll be sending out all the details on, on that very shortly. Again, thank you so much for your participation as usually. As usual, it was very engaging and the questions are great. Thank you so much, James and Raphael. I appreciate you guys joining us. I'm sad that we're at the end of our employer brand topic, um, but maybe you'll have something to share on DNI. who knows. Uh, but we'll chat again soon. And again, thank you all for joining. See you Thanks next so. week. Bye. Bye.